Hi, this is Chris Young. Welcome to episode 27 of Contemplating a Life. This week we continue reminiscing about my junior year of high school and spending the days traveling back and forth between a special education school and my regular neighborhood high school. In my junior year of high school, I was 16 years old. And that's the age when you become eligible for a driver's license. It's also the age when dating becomes a major part of your social life. Despite the normalcy of attending a regular high school, my inability to drive a car severely limited my experience in these difficult teenage years. Even if I had what could be considered a reasonable chance of persuading a girl to go out with me, the prospect of having my parents drive me on a date was not at all appealing. I also couldn't envision my parents allowing a girl to drive my wheelchair van. The issue was moot anyway, because I never found a girl with whom I figured I had even half a chance at success. In my neighborhood, there was a girl whose name escapes me right now. But at one point, she stated she wanted to be my girlfriend. I think I was about 15, maybe she was 16. Her tone of voice made it obvious she was making fun of me and it wasn't the least bit serious. I told her I just didn't believe her. It wasn't funny. I did nothing to deserve her cruelty, and she should just go fuck off. Decades later, I fantasized about what I wish I had said. I wish I'd told her that she was nothing but an airhead dizzy blonde. I wanted to say because she was so hot-looking, she'd probably attract some football player who would have wished he had an IQ gradually approaching a hundred, assuming he even knew what that meant. He would probably blow out his knees in the senior homecoming game. He'd never go to college. He'd get a job at a warehouse or as a truck driver. He'd keep her barefoot and pregnant, come home drunk every night, and beat the crap out of her. I would explain that in contrast, I was college-bound with a career as a computer programmer. I would likely make a six-figure salary and I was capable of being the most loving and devoted companion she could ever wish for. I didn't exactly fulfill the destiny that I imagined for myself in those days. I did go to college, earn a BS degree in computer science, and get a decent job. I worked for Indiana University, but I never made much money. My salary of $11,700 per year in 1977 is the equivalent of 58700 in today's money. But had my disability not cut my career short, and I'd worked in the private sector instead of the university, I could have easily made six figures eventually. I had to quit my job after two years because I lacked the stamina to work a 40-hour week. Even though I'm still a bit bitter towards her for thinking she could toy with my feelings and make fun of me, I hope my vision for her future didn't exactly come out true for her sake. I have no idea what happened to her after she moved out of the neighborhood. I continued to have feelings for my junior high crush, Rosie Schumann. Although she did go out a couple of times with some other guys, she was never in a serious relationship throughout high school. And that gave me hope that eventually she would reconsider our relationship and come back to me. You may recall episode 22, where I read my award-winning article, The Reunion. I recounted the story of a rap session we had at Roberts. Again, note we weren't spitting words to a beat. In those days, a rap session meant we had a sort of a town hall meeting in which people expressed their feelings. I made a big speech about the depression we were all feeling about dealing with a disability during our teenage years. Well, it turns out I had another opportunity to discuss life with disability at a rap session at Northwest. There were racial tensions at Northwest High School in the 1970s. U.S. District Court Judge Hugh S. Dillon issued a series of rulings that Indianapolis Public Schools was guilty of racial segregation in violation of the famous Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court case. 
He ruled that the violation was de jure, which means by law, not by circumstance. Historically, IPS had forced all black students to attend Crispus Attucks High School. That, along with other policies, such as real estate redlining, caused a migration of much of the black population to concentrate in certain neighborhoods. Even though IPS no longer forced segregation, the damage had been done. He also ruled that a contributing factor was the so-called UNIGOV initiative. UNIGOV was the legislation that merged Indianapolis City and Marion County governments, but excluded the merger of IPS and suburban Marion County school districts. The judge also cited the failure to establish public housing in suburban areas. IPS was forced to reassign staff and to bus children within the district to achieve better racial balance. In an effort to ease racial tension and create positive dialogue, all of the English classes at Northwest took time off from the regular curriculum for one day to have a sort of a town hall discussion of racial issues. Everyone had to take some sort of English class all four years. So having it during English ensured everyone participated. Teachers invited students to share their feelings about race honestly and openly. I thought the session conducted by my English teacher, I don't recall her name, went really well. Black and white students admitted their biases without the discussion turning nasty. At one point, the topic of interracial dating arose. In those days, it was quite rare. There was opposition expressed to it on both sides. Some said they would not consider an interracial relationship for fear of backlash. Why bother exposing yourself to all that stigma? If you got married, your children would suffer as well. Then someone uttered the cliche excuse, well, I guess it's okay if they really love one another. I thought that was ridiculous. How do you get to that point? Unless you have that magic fairy tale love at first sight, how do you fall in love with someone if you aren't allowed to date them, get to know them, and then possibly fall in love? Why is it okay to date someone of your own race if you aren't in love, but you have to be in love for an interracial relationship? That's when I spoke up. I said... We've had people here today honestly and openly admit prejudices and biases. But I have a question for you. I want to reassure you no one's feelings will be hurt by how you respond. You've talked about the difficulties of interracial dating. But my question is, would you date someone in a wheelchair? I think there are prejudices and biases towards handicapped people. I still cherish the approving smile on the teacher's face when I said that. I don't know if she knew it before, but she knew it then. This is why Chris is in this school. This is why he needs to be here. Not just for him, but for everyone else in the room. One of the girls was curious about how that would work logistically. She correctly assumed I couldn't drive. I explained I had a wheelchair van. I wasn't sure if my parents would allow my date to drive it. Well, although having my parents as a chauffeur chaperone wasn't ideal, it was an option. One girl hesitantly and awkwardly raised the issue of a physical relationship. When you date someone, even casually, there's still the issue in the back of your mind that this might be someone you want to spend the rest of your life with. Long term, she'd want to know if the guy could be a husband in every sense of the word. My reply was, that's a legitimate concern. It's something a handicapped person might have to address earlier in the relationship than you might normally discuss it. Let me just say that handicapped people have to have a very strong will to deal with everyday life. 
As the saying goes, if there's a will, there's a way. One of the guys brought up another cliche scenario. Don't you hear these stories all the time about guys coming back from Vietnam with an injury and they end up falling in love with their nurse or their physical therapist and get married? They make it work. I tried not to laugh. I said, yeah, but there's a big difference in the relationship between a patient and a nurse versus the guy and some girl in his English class. This goes back to that statement someone made earlier. It's okay if they really love one another. But how do you get from here to there, whether you're dealing with a handicap or a racial difference? If it's not okay to date someone unless you really love them, how do you get to that point? They didn't have an answer to those questions. I allowed them to move on by thanking them for their honest replies. Instead, I just wanted to give them something to think about, that prejudice and bias takes many forms. The teacher continued to smile. I wish I'd run into her maybe years later and ask her what she was thinking that day. It didn't result in any of the girls coming up to me afterwards and offering a date, but that wasn't the point. Maybe they would look differently at the next guy or girl they met in a wheelchair. The folks at Roberts did their best to give us social opportunities. We had a class picnic every year that was reasonably fun. There was a balcony porch just outside the high school classrooms. We persuaded them to allow us to go outside during nice weather to get a break from the monotony of having nothing to do half the day. Eventually, they obtained a picnic table, and we could sit there and actually do some studying in a better environment. Some of the guys would smoke out there. Others, like myself, would serve as lookout. If a teacher came, we would signal, and they would throw their butt over the railing. There was probably a huge pile of cigarette butts in the bushes down below. The teachers admonished us, the lookouts are just as guilty as the offenders. Her attitude was, yeah, so what? Catch us if you can. The biggest attempt to create a normal high school experience was that we had a prom each spring. It was a single event for both juniors and seniors. Because that only involved about a dozen people at best, recent alumni were also invited. As to that, most people brought a date, some of which were outside the school, and it made for a reasonably sized little party, if not a massive event. For my junior year, I didn't want to go. I didn't have a date. An excuse I gave was that everyone would be getting their picture taken with a date, and I didn't want to be left out. Rosie said that if that was my only concern, she would agree that I could have my picture taken with her. She didn't have a boyfriend, but her official date for her junior year was some goofy kid named Richard, who also didn't have a date. It was clear she only considered him her date because she felt sorry for him. They arrived separately and went home separately. It was nothing but a photo op for him as well, even though she called him her date. The teacher spent hours for days decorating the auditorium with crepe paper streamers. We had some sort of background for the photos, and there was a theme, but I don't recall what it was. They hired a band. It was a fairly lame garage band made up of some friends of Alan Whitney. I seem to recall that Alan sat in with the band to sing a couple of numbers. There were snacks, punch, cake, finger food available. It wasn't a terrible experience. It was kind of fun to get dressed up and have a little party to celebrate the end of the school year. But overall, it was pretty lame. The photographer for the event was a teacher, Mr. Ball. He taught what we called the special ed class. It seems strange that a school that was entirely special ed, we singled out one class and called it that. 
It was a non-grade program for kids with both physical and intellectual disabilities. The teacher had professional photography equipment, and he used it as a hobby or a side business. He had a large format camera, professional light stands. It all looked pretty expensive. He seemed to know what he was doing. I got my photo taken with Rosie. We were first in line. When he finally developed the film, he couldn't find our photo. The only reason I went to the damn thing was to get my picture taken. I didn't even get that. Oh, well, there's always next year. Next week, I'll talk about my senior year, which was much more fun than my junior year. We'll have yet another prom, another town hall meeting, and more stories about my mentor, Mr. Irwin. I'll go on actual dates with, spoilers, I'm not going to tell you who, I'll relive the joys and fears of graduation. If you find this podcast educational, entertaining, enlightening, or even inspiring, consider sponsoring me on Patreon for just $5 per month. We get early access to the podcast and any other benefits I might come up with down the road. Although I have some financial struggles, I'm not really in this for the money. But still, every little bit helps. Many thanks to my Patreon supporters. Your support pays for the writing seminar I attend, but mostly I appreciate it because it shows how much you care and appreciate what I'm doing. Your support means more to me than words can express. Even if you can't provide financial support, please post links and share this podcast on social media so I can grow my audience. If you have any comments, questions, or other feedback, please feel free to comment on any of the platforms where you find this podcast. I'll see you next week as we continue contemplating life. Until then, fly safe, everyone.